spot. We're going to kick things off on time. Um, today's session is the first um, in, a, in an, an initial three-part subfloor preparation series presented by Seth Pavanik of Ardex Americas. I'll introduce Seth in uh, just a little bit, but uh, first a little housekeeping. Um, we uh, thank our national education leaders, uh, our sponsors. Here they are, <clears throat> Ardex Americas, Custom Building Products, Merchant One Payments, Tarket, and Wilson M. Beck Insurance Group. Um, very supportive of what we're doing with education, year round sponsors, um, and uh, we couldn't do what we do without them and also great support from our members. Uh, you're making a difference. We're putting uh, those memberships uh, to good use, trust me, in the background here. So secondly, um, as we put our education series together, we have a series of events coming up over the next, we're trying to do one per month, make it a really good quality um, uh, hour of, of, <clears throat> of content. You, know, you can see by inviting someone like Seth to the table here, he knows his stuff. He's an expert, well-respected throughout the industry. And um, <clears throat> so his, his uh, series on subfloors is gonna be very valuable. So outside of that, when we get to um, other um, sessions, we'll be looking at, uh, well, in January will be gypsum by Seth. Uh, in February will be wood subfloors and panel underlayment. In March, we are inviting ICRI, the International Concrete Repair Institute, to do a session on moisture testing. Um, then in April, the business of the business, a local business leader, very astute individual, will be talking about how to steer your business through difficult times and everything from bonding insurance to you name it, um, as opposed to just focusing on frontline stuff like installation challenges. Um, and then in May, uh, understanding and deciphering the specification. We have Keith Robinson, of, uh, who's a senior architect at Dialogue, is committed to um, helping us understand the relationship between Division 9, Division 3, Division 1, and how we can estimate um, actually understanding what all that language is supposed to be telling us to do or not do. Um, very valuable stuff. So that'll take us up to May, and then there will be more um, events loaded. Everybody on this call, any member who has uh, given us their email ad address will get uh, advance warning of, of all events coming up. So lots coming, stay tuned. Um, so prep, prep, prep is what we're talking about today. For me, um, there's two, two sort of angles on this whole prep thing. One that Seth is gonna dig into, the technical side. And then the other is who's gonna pay for all this fabulous information we're imparting on the general contractor. And if uh, you don't have both looked after, there's going to be delays, there's going to be conflict. Um, the second, the latter, who's going to pay for it, is really spelled out in trade scope of work for the floor covering installer. And when we get that trade scope of work understood, spelled out, and included in specifications so that everybody right from the get-go knows what they're bidding on, we'll find that the general contractor can budget it, carry it, uh, carry that price, schedule the work, and then um, issue the contract to get it done right. Either the contract will go as a billable extra to the floor guy or floor person, I should say, um, or a third party or the GC does it themselves. But <clears throat> if we don't have that conversation, that won't happen as we all know, we've all been on site trying to get paid for doing good work in difficult circumstances. And, and uh, you know, we're not gonna make it perfect, but we will push things in the right direction and start by getting everybody on the same page. So those are the two angles on, on prep for me. Um, today, we're delighted to invite Seth Pavanik, Ardex Americas, to um, the table to share his, his wealth of knowledge and, and give up his time, his valuable time. A little introduction, Seth has worked uh, for Ardex Americas in the technical service department since 1991. Um, it's quite the anniversary you've got coming up next year, uh, Seth. Seth. Yep. Um, he is a strong technical professional skilled in education training, technical communication, personnel management, product testing and development, and complaint management. Complaints, what are they? I, you know, in the flooring trade, we don't have to deal with those. <clears throat> don't let that secret out, Seth, otherwise your phone is going to ring off the hook from here on in. I hear you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Seth is an active participant in numerous standards bodies, notable standards bodies and associations such as ANSI, American National Standards Institute, um, IICRC, Institute of Inspection, Cleaning and Restoration Certification, ASTM International, and 
INSTOR, in, uh, International Standards and Training Alliance, um, some big hitting names there, very important organizations. And I'm um, glad to report, Seth, that you can add NFCA to your list now. Ha ha. <laughs> Appreciate you being here. So it's great to contact with you. Uh, you know, if you learn nothing from this session, you will be able to walk away with uh, Seth's contact details and you can talk about your individual challenges with him offline. Um, last bit of housekeeping here is questions. You will have questions. Uh, you're welcome to type them in at the bottom. There's the Zoom uh, tool at the bottom for typing them out. We want to keep things rolling forward. We have 45 minutes to deal with four weeks worth of information. This topic is not solvable in 45 minutes, but uh, we'll deal with some of the bigger rocks, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, the questions will be dealt with at the end. We'll, we'll pick through them and uh, that, you know, we'll be over to Seth to, to deal with that. And so without further ado, Seth, I'm gonna hand the screen over to you once I stop my share. And I think you can now start sharing your screen. Will do. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. You can hear me okay? Yes. Good. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Lee. Uh, it's an honor to be presenting today uh, for NFCA. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, as Chris said, I'm the Director of Technical for Ardex. Uh, been with them for, yes, quite a few years, dating back to 1991. I grew up uh, as, a, as a gopher, uh, as my grandfather was a general contractor, so kind of grew up in the construction industry. Uh, I think I look pretty good for 74. All right, enough of the funny stuff. My apologies here. Okay, so what are we going to do today? We are going to spend some time talking about proper substrate preparation for the installation of patching and leveling materials. And before we get into all the meat here, um, I want to make sure uh, that we understand a little something about these materials and their chemical makeup. Um, patching and leveling materials, um, Portland cement based. Well, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Uh, the bottom line here is these products could be Portland cement. Uh, they could be uh, based on calcium aluminate cement, uh, calcium sulfate cement, um, maybe some other cements. But the typical patching and leveling materials uh, out there in the market are, are, are a blend of cements. Uh, could include Portland, could include calcium aluminate uh, and other cements. I say this because I wanna to talk to you about a term in the name, it's a little bit, a term in the industry that's a little bit misunderstood. And that term is hydraulic cement. Um, and this is, this is from master spec, just a, a specification. This is division three in concrete where they have specified a hydraulic cement based underlayment uh, for use under interior floor coverings. Uh, some people may look at that and say hydraulic cement. I mean, uh, don't we use that to fix uh, cracks and dams to start stop water from leaking or, you know, don't they use that to pump that underneath the concrete to, to jack the slab up or fill a void underneath the slab to provide some uh, support there. Uh, but the bottom line is patching and leveling materials are hydraulic cements. And I say this uh, because the definition of hydraulic cement, uh, as I put on the screen here, is a binder system used in concrete subfloor assemblies that harden by chemical reaction with water. All these products are cement materials that you mix with water hard by chemically reacting via hydration. Uh, and that, that classifies them as a hydro hydraulic cement, okay? And that's defined by ASTM and uh, the standard um, F141, uh, standard terminology relating to resilient floor coverings, okay? Just want to make that clear for everybody that these products are hydraulic cements. If you hear them referred to as hydraulic cements, it, it is a true statement because they react chemically with water and set via that chemistry. So we're going to take a look at the program description, you know, what the uh, proper prep's about. Uh, we'll get into preparation of concrete, the types of mechanical preparation, the different treatments of concrete, contamination that you guys will see out on site, uh, adhesive residues, and we will wrap it up with uh, joints and cracks. And uh, as Chris said, um, I got a lot of information here. I want to try to get through all of this and we'll leave some time at the end 
uh, that we can um, do a little Q&A. And I'm more than happy to stay online, you know, past one o'clock uh, your time, uh, as long as necessary to answer questions. My pleasure. So proper prep, I mean, this is not a one size fits all philosophy. The bottom line here and the goal of proper prep is, is to make the right recommendation on each individual job site. Not all job sites are the same. The bottom line here is the industry, industry has a solution for everything, just like hussies. What, what, what more can you want? Guns, wedding gowns, and cold beer all at the same store. The thing that I want you guys to understand with patching and leveling products, these products are to repair or smooth the surface of substrates to receive flooring, okay? They are not structural repair materials. You have to have a structurally sound subfloor or substrate prior to the installation of these products. Now, new concrete and the condition of new concrete is largely going to be determined on how it's placed or finished. I'm sure you guys see this day in, day out. And certainly renovation is going to be unique to every job site. And I'm sure you guys have walked on to job sites looking like this. But the bottom line here is the concrete needs to be clean, sound, and solid to receive patching and leveling materials. So let's look at some criteria here. Um, it's industry standards uh, for, for concrete. You know, number one, compressive strength. Compressive strength um, is basically taking a two-inch cube of material in a lab and smashing it until it fails, and you get basically a pounds per square inch reading. And um, as an industry standard, you know, concrete should have a minimum compressive strength of 3,000, okay? Uh, another industry standard is density. So, you know, if you took concrete and put it into a one foot by one foot by one foot uh, box, uh, so you basically had a cubic foot of concrete, structural concrete would, would weigh roughly 140 to 150 pounds, okay? Then you can have, non, you can have lightweight uh, structural concrete uh, and then you can have um, concrete that is, is lightweight and non-structural. But we're dealing with uh, need, the need of structural concrete um, for patching and leveling materials. So the minimum density would be 100 pounds per cubic foot. Uh, another industry standard is tensile strength. And tensile strength is basically pulling something apart until you get a fa failure, okay? And it's very common um, that the tensile strength is, is roughly 10%, maybe 15% of the compressive strength, uh, just from a mathematical standpoint. But from an industry standard, the concrete should have at least a 200 pounds um, tensile strength. And that test is conducted in accordance with ASTM C1583. So three, three good things to keep in mind here or make note of. Um, the concrete uh, compressive strength, at least 3,000, tensile of at least 200, and uh, if it's lightweight concrete, it's got to be structural, at least 100 pounds per cubic foot. Uh, you guys walk onto a site and you see concrete flaking like you see here. Uh, you got to get down to the good stuff. You know, that softer, weak top layer is uh, going to cause failure in the patch or leveling material. Okay, the most effective way to ensure that you're down to clean solid concrete is by mechanical means. And there's several methods of mechanically cleaning concrete. Uh, one of the most efficient ways uh, and cost effective ways is shot blasting. Okay, a self contained machine that um, has a, a motor and a wheel that throws uh, steel shot at the floor at a very high velocity and it works on impact resistance. The, the steel shot hit the concrete and they pulverize the surface, taking the contaminants along with it. Uh, these machines have uh, you know, large vacuums uh, with HEPA, HEPA filters in them that pull the dust and debris off, but the shot's too heavy, so it's get, it gets recirculated. Uh, and it's a continuous process of blasting that surface with this steel shot, you know, leaving a very clean surface um, left behind. You know, a couple of pictures I have here, um, you know, you can see the light whitish look of that concrete, um, has a little bit of a texture to it, but it's, it's certainly clean, and that's the result of shot blasting. Um, a little bit better picture maybe is, is the one I have here. You can see that shot blasted surface. Uh, you got a little bit of an overlap line. So you got a little bit of the cornrows going on. 
and you're down to clean uh, concrete. You can actually see some of the aggregate in the concrete there. So very effective mean, uh, means of cleaning concrete. Uh, grinding is another mechanical method of uh, cleaning concrete. You, keep, you see a couple of small grinders here, handheld angle grinders with dustless shroud and uh, back systems hook up, hooked up to it uh, for doing edge work. Uh, you got a small walk behind grinder as well with the same similar shroud and, and back system with HEPA filtration on it so that you're um, grinding uh, dust free. Um, and we obviously have very large grinders, uh, walk behind grinders, uh, planetary grinders with different diamond heads uh, and blades on it uh, for, for cleaning concrete. Um, again, with the dustless shroud, the, the, the HEPA vac, uh, vac filtration system on there leaving uh, a very clean surface. Um, I will say this though, um, you know, you will have uh, dust residue in the pores uh, after grinding, no matter uh, how good your um, grinder and vac system is, and you typically have to come back with a, a wand and do some deep vacuuming to get those minute dust particles out of the pores of the concrete that are resolved from grinding. Um, might be a little bit difficult to see, but this is a ground surface, uh, and you can kind of see the swirl marks uh, in there, the pattern in the concrete leaves a little bit different uh, profile, a little bit different texture than, than shop blasting. Another method is scarifying. Um, you can see here, um, a lot of scarifiers, unfortunately, are, are uh, fossil fuel driven, gasoline driven, uh, you know, okay for outside, but not too conducive to interior preparation. Uh, another picture here, unfortunately, you know, with uh, gas, uh, you know, is the, is the power supply here, but they do have, um, you know, 220 uh, volt uh, scarifiers. Uh, and these scarifiers, are, scarifiers basically have uh, these washers on them with, with angular teeth on them. Uh, a lot of them have tungsten carbide tips on them. And if you can picture, you know, maybe uh, an axle with uh, some 30, 40, 50 tooth washers on them, and maybe there's four or five axles that complete a rotation and this spins towards the surface of the concrete, basically ripping the surface of the concrete off. Uh, and when you do that, you're obviously taking the contamination with it. Uh, very noisy, you know, a little bit dusty, uh, but nonetheless, it's a mechanical method of prep. You know, I've been around for a lot of years. You know, one of the newer methods, I'm not sure that everybody's uh, aware of or has seen uh, is called shaving. Um, basically uh, concrete shaving, if you will. And when we take a look at shaving, uh, it has a single axle with a, with a number of diamond blades on, on this axle. And this axle uh, spins at a very high velocity. And you're able to dial down the, this axle towards the concrete and set it at a, at a required depth, whether it's, it's hitting the concrete at an eighth inch or going down into maybe a quarter inch of the concrete and shavings used when you have more deep uh, contamination in the concrete. And, and the application of, of using the, you know, the shaver is kind of like cutting your grass. You're just kind of walking behind it. And it's leaving kind of a corduroy type appearance to it, uh, a series of grooves from those um, uh, diamond blades. And what typically happens is you know, you have this corduroy appearance, um, you know, you may be removing a, a quarter inch of the concrete with a shaver. A lot of uh, contractors will come in, they'll do a light grind on it to, to take those corduroy grooves off and, and then do a light shop blast to remove debris and create an even texture. Uh, not that it has to be done every time, but uh, that's typically what's done when we're, we're getting into a, removing some serious depth of, uh, of concrete with a shaver. Um, one of the things that I want to make uh, known to you, and Chris had mentioned um, uh, ICRI uh, coming in to do some moisture testing certification, uh, maybe in March, I think he may have said that. But, but the International Concrete uh, Repair Institute has also devised a series of, of rubber stamps, uh, rubber concrete uh, profiles. Um, these, these stamps, these profiles have different uh, degrees of textures to it, and uh, they're used to basically gauge the texture of a substrate. Uh, and I see this because, or I say this because many products out there specify uh, different degrees of texture or profile uh, on a concrete to receive their products. You get into structural repair and some of these structural repair products require very aggressive, very textured concrete. 
Uh, some of the mitigation systems require, you know, specific profiles as well, maybe not quite so aggressive. Um, you know, other products may require a little bit of a profile. So taking a look at these, if you look at the uh, CSP number one, um, it has very little texture whatsoever. You look at CSP number two, you can see some grind marks in it. So CSP two is kind of equivalent to grinding. Uh, a CSP three has a little bit more texture, kind of comparable to a light shop last. Uh, a CSP four <clears throat> is kind of similar to uh, maybe a light scarification, a little bit more texture than a three, obviously. Okay, you get into a five and it might be a heavy shop last. Six, heavier scarification. You get into seven, eight, nine, ten, and you're getting into bush hammering to create some serious profile. So I want to make a, make you guys aware, if you're not aware, of the profiles and these rubber stamps um, from the International Concrete Repair Institute. Um, you know, if you do a lot of prep, uh, a lot of these products require prep. It's it's a great tool to have in your bag to confirm that the proper profile has been achieved on the concrete surface. Seth, just a comment. Um, we're, yeah. we're looking, if you're installing resilient flooring, we're looking for a CSP of typically two. And uh, if you're pouring hydraulic cement, is it right? You're looking for a CSP of three? Um, the, I would say the mitigation systems, moisture mitigation systems will require a minimum of three. Your hydraulic cements um, get into the topping, the finished wear surfaces, they may require a three. But the bottom line, generally speaking, you got to check with your manufacturers to be certain. But generally speaking, um, it just need need to be clean and absorbent. Uh, so it could be a one, two, something like that. Uh, clean and absorbent in, in some cases. In other cases, with the right primer, it may not need a profile at all. And we'll kind of mention that in a, in a future slide here. I think absorbent is the key word, right? Uh, I also, have you heard of an app that you can load on your phone, photograph the surface of the concrete, and it will give you a CSP? Wow, that that I am not aware of, but if, if there's one available, I'd love to know about it. Yeah, I think it's, I forget who mentioned that to me, but uh, look for that. I think it's gonna be, you know, it'll it'll come out eventually. Yeah, yeah, definitely agree. Good, good point, Chris, thanks. Um, we're gonna switch over to concrete treatments here, and we're gonna start with curing uh, concrete. Um, concrete needs to be cured. So you pour concrete, it has water in it. If the water evaporates too quickly, the chemistry doesn't happen and the concrete doesn't develop its strength. So we need to cure it um, so the water does not leave too quickly from that concrete. And there are several ways that you can cure concrete. Um, you can do it the old fashioned way and cover it. You know, years ago, maybe when you were a kid, you, they poured your sidewalk and they covered it with plastic or covered it with burlap and said, keep it wet for a week. You know, that's a method of curing, um, you know, like you see here in the picture. Um, commercial construction, you know, typically what, I'm oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Before we go on to another method of curing, we're going to, we'll, we'll focus on the wet cure. So um, if we have concrete that is, is wet cured with a polyethylene sheet, um, you know, plastic, you know, something like that, no curing compounds used, no liquid uh, sprayed on curing compounds. From a prep standpoint, you know, we need to remove superficial contamination uh, drywall mud, paint over spray, things like that. But we don't necessarily need to mechanically clean to create absorbent or, or, or profiled concrete. Um, there are some patching materials that stick directly to uh, clean uh, burnish type concrete. And, and there's some leveling materials that can, can adhere to that with an appropriate primer, two component uh, epoxy type primers. But the bottom line here is you check with your manufacturer. For the specific recommendations. Okay, now we move on to curing concrete with curing compounds. So commercially, we typically see this where they, you know, they screed float finish concrete today and before they go home, they spray a liquid cure and seal curing compound on that surface. And it's basically a sealer that retards the evaporation of water so that, that concrete can cure and develop the necessary strength. There are several types of curing compounds. There's wax emulsions, and these are these are bond breakers for patching or leveling materials. And any type of a wax emulsion's got to be mechanically removed. Um, a lot of curing compounds out there are clear hydrocarbon resins. They're either solvent-borne or waterborne. Um, these products are referred to as dissipating curing compounds. 
um, because they dissipate with foot traffic or they dissipate for ultraviolet light. And these are the most dangerous because, you know, they may dissipate in the middle of the, the slab or the um, middle of the room where the, everybody walks and where the sunlight hits it. But, you know, where it's over near the wall where nobody walks and there's no sunlight, you know, there's still residue there. So the, these dissipating types, they, they must be mechanically removed down to clean concrete, clean absorbent concrete. However, there are non-dissipating uh, clear acrylic products, uh, sometimes solvent-borne, but uh, present day, most of them are waterborne. And a lot of products out there um, are able to stick to acrylics. They like to stick into acrylics. The primers that are out there in the industry are acrylic type materials. So the bottom line here is we need to evaluate for absorbency, okay? And check with your manufacturer, but if you're 100% certain with what um, curing compound was used, and it falls into this category, um, you know, it's possible to prime and it's possible, um, you know, whether it's absorbent or non-absorbent to prime um, and, and install a patching leveling material. Um, but, you know, test areas should be done on site because manufacturers are not out there testing their products over all different types of curing compounds or sealing compounds. If there's any type of doubt, mechanically remove it down to concrete and take all risk out of the equation. Okay, but I'm you know, letting you know on certain situations, certain applications with test areas, uh, it may be suitable to install over a concrete slab that has been treated with uh, certain types of non-dissipating acrylic curing compounds. Test areas are always key. Uh, just a picture of a non-dissipating a, a cure um, con or concrete slab with a non-dissipating acrylic curing compound, um, re removing uh, superficial contamination, and um, checking with the manufacturer and uh, priming as necessary. Test areas, test areas, test areas. Um, sealing compounds. Okay, there's acrylic sealers, epoxy uh, sealers, and coatings out there. And there are products out there that uh, are able to stick to the, these surfaces provided they're clean. Might be a two component primer. Again, check with your manufacturers and you have to be 100% certain with what product was used. Um, urethanes on the other hand are very, tip, very difficult to adhere to. Um, and there's other products out there like methyl methacrylates and polyaspartics that they're also difficult to stick to. So again, get with your manufacturers. If we're certain that it's an acrylic, certain that it's an epoxy, um, you can do some test areas with the right primer and uh, have success. Testing for curing and sealing compounds, okay? So you can't just tell by looking, you know, we looked at burnished concrete, we looked at concrete with a cure and seal, we really couldn't tell the difference. Um, you can't tell by doing water absorption testing either because if it's burnished concrete, water doesn't want to soak into it. If it's a sealed uh, concrete, water doesn't want to soak into it. Okay, so what do we do? We make a cut with the utility knife, we see if the absorption cha uh, changes. We can also scratch the surface with a knife. Okay, if we see gray dust, um, you know, then we're looking at uh, scratching the concrete. If you take any type of clear film and you scratch it with a knife and flake some of it off, it typically appears white. So if you're flaking little bits of white off there, there's a good chance that that's a curing compound or some sort of sealer that's on the surface. And lastly, you can test for pH. Uh, do a pH test, okay? If there's a sealer on the surface of that concrete, you're not gonna get a pH reading of, of acidic or alkaline. It's gonna be more neutral, okay? Uh, if it's uh, concrete uh, and you do a pH test, you know, you're gonna to to get a pH of nine or 10, something like that. Because when you do pH on concrete, that's what it tests at. So just some uh, guidelines there for testing for curing or sealing compounds. A couple of things that I want to talk to you about here are silicates and fly ash. Okay, silicates, uh, sodium, potassium, or lithium, they're reactive water based chemicals that react with concrete, uh, components of the concrete. Um, fly ash is a byproduct 
uh, of burning coal in the um, power plants and the electric uh, electricity producing power plants. Uh, you burn coal as a part of that power plant. The, the result of that is a material that's called fly ash. Both silicates and fly ash are used in concrete and they're two critical parts, especially for installation of patching and leveling materials and flooring. So I want to talk a little bit about cement hydration here uh, because it, we're going to apply this to, to, to fly ash and the use of, of silicates. So um, PC, that's Portland cement, that's the main binder, uh, main material in concrete. Um, H2O, um, you may have heard of that before, uh, that's uh, known as water. And when you mix cement and water, that becomes the paste in concrete that holds all the aggregate together. And, you know, Portland cement uh, is a hydraulic cement as well because the cement's reacting with the water and it's developing strength. Um, the chemistry that's created as a part of the Portland cement reacting the water is called calcium silicate hydrate, CHS. That's the main binder chemically that's holding this concrete together. The byproduct of that chemistry is called calcium hydroxide, CaOH2, okay? That um, CHOH2 um, is, is basically free lime in concrete. That calcium hydroxide is free lime. It's just in concrete as a result of the curing process. It's just there not hurting anything, it's just in there. So these reactive silicates, they will, uh, the, the sodium, the potassium, the lithium silicates, they react with this lime, the calcium hydroxide that's in the concrete. And chemically, they create additional calcium silicate hydrate, the more, or the main binder that's binding concrete together. So all the pores that are in concrete uh, basically, when the, the silicate reacts with the calcium hydroxide, it's filling the pores of the concrete with additional calcium silicate hydrate. It's densifying that concrete, making it non-porous. And the same similar thing is happening with fly ash. Fly ash is a, is a, is a material, uh, as I said, that's a, res a byproduct of burning coal. And they put this fly ash granular powder in with concrete as a part of the mix. It reacts with the free lime, the calcium hydroxide, and creates additional calcium silicate hydrate. And it's basically also densifying the concrete. So I wanted you to understand the chemistry first of what's happening here, so that now we can talk about these two materials and what we need to be aware of um, for patching leveling materials and finished flooring. These reactions are exothermic chemical reactions. So this is silicate treated concrete here. Sodium, potassium, lithium materials. They can actually be added to the mix into the concrete itself uh, during placement. They can actually be topically applied to the concrete, um, act as a finishing aid, and they can actually be applied to concrete that's years old to densify the concrete, okay? When these silicates react, react with the calcium hydroxide, uh, hydroxide and create more calcium silicate hydrate, they're densifying the concrete. They are making the, the, the concrete uh, non-porous, non-absorbent, okay? And you can do an absorbency test, uh, ASTM 3191, to see if that concrete is or isn't absorbent. The main thing we got to keep in mind here, okay, if a silicate was used, is there's no more residue at the surface of uh, silicate, unreacted silicate, okay, and the surface is clean, but that surface may be non-absorbent and may require a different primer to get a chemical bond to the surface of that concrete. Um, it may require uh, mechanical preparation potentially, okay. You got to check with your manufacturer to see what their recommendations are when dealing with silica treated concrete. Fly ash, okay, similar from a reaction standpoint, okay, but fly ash is a part of the mix design. The ready mix companies design a mix and have fly ash as a part of that mix, okay. It's very commonly in concrete. If you look at concrete uh, mix designs, you'll see fly ash in there, maybe you know, 8%, 6%, 10%, maybe, 
maybe up to 15%, okay? And it's it's really has no adverse effect on anything that we do day in, day out with patching and leveling materials or adhesives and floor coverings. However, uh, there can be uh, fly ash um, concrete that have some very high percentages um, up into 30 and the, the 40 percent range. Okay, and it can create a surface uh, that's it's really non absorbent. And we got to look at doing the absorbency test again to see whether that concrete's absorbent. Okay, but when we get up to these high levels, uh, 30 percent, 40 percent, I mean, there can be some problems. There could be unreacted fly ash in that mix because remember the fly ash is not reacting with the water. The fly ash is reacting with the byproduct of the, the concrete chemistry, that lime that's in there, that calcium hydroxide that's in there. And there's only a certain amount of free lime in the concrete for it to react with. Um, there can be slow strength development. which also could uh, possibly create a little bit of a weak surface. So if we know about uh, a concrete surf, a concrete mix that has a lot of fly ash, then you, know, we, you guys as, as, as um, you know, installers and contractors, you know, just need to raise the red flag with your manufacturers and pull us experts in with you to talk through and see what the right recommendation is gonna be to make sure that you get the right recommendation for a successful installation. I just want you to raise the red flag and make the appropriate parties, parties aware and, and we can help you through. Precast concrete, okay? This is uh, referred to as holocore concrete uh, because the core of it is hollow and you, act, you can actually see it in the cross section of the picture there. Uh, these are made at a plant, okay? They're trucked on site, craned into place um, you typically don't have to do any sort of aggressive mechanical preparation. Um, you're going to have superficial contamination that needs to be removed. Um, you're going to have some mud where they mud the joints that's going to have to be removed, but it's not like you have to go in and shop last or diamond grind the whole surface typically on a precast concrete slab. Superficial contamination, yes, um, but generally speaking, uh, somewhat clean. Tilt wall construction. Not sure how much of, uh, you, um, how much tilt wall you guys run into out there, but this is where you pour a concrete slab, let it cure, put a release agent on it, pour another slab on top of it, and then uh, once that cures, you, you tilt it up with a crane and it becomes a wall. Uh, the problem is is the parting of release agents they put on the surface, and that can be bond breakers to patching and leveling materials and flooring. Because, because that's what they do. They put it on the concrete so that the second slab doesn't bond to the first slab. So tilt wall uh, construction, that raises the red flag for you. There's gonna be some sort of parting or uh, release agent on the surface. It's gonna have to be mechanically cleaned. We've talked about test areas here. You know, test areas, test areas, test areas. You know, have your manufacturers come out with you to do test areas in some of these applications. Uh, to ensure that you got a good bond. You know, what do you see? Okay, you do you do destructive damage. You get a hammer, a chisel, a sledgehammer, and you beat beat the patch up, you beat the leveling material up. Is it, you know, chipping off in very small fractured uh, uh, surfaces? Um, or is it, or like in the picture on the right, just coming off in, uh, in, in large areas? You know, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but if you look at the, this, this dark line here uh, at the edge of the bond, uh, bottom left part of the right picture, you can see where it's disbonded. So, you know, a well-bonded uh, material is gonna be extremely difficult to, to remove from the surface, but you can have your manufacturers involved with those tests. Hang in there, guys, we're getting there. Paint, um, certainly flaking paint is, is a no-no. Um, you know, if the paint's coming off, you know, even if you can bond to it, then the whole system's gonna disbond because the paint's disbonding. Mechanically remove paint. Um, marker paint, like you see in the bottom right picture, um, you know, there's risk uh, of that causing a bond failure. You know, we've seen other types of markers that have bled through and stained resilient flooring. 
you know, spend 17 seconds and take a grinder and buzz the surface of the concrete to get that marker paint off. Okay, take it out of the equation. All right, maybe it takes 27 seconds, but it's quick, pretty quick to remove. Drywall mud, uh, another uh, another contaminant. Uh, you know, you swear that these guys are, you know, having uh, either getting paid by the bucket of mud uh, per job, or they're having mud fights because I swear they get more mud on the floor than they do the walls or the or the ceilings. Um, but uh, mechanically remove the drywall mud. Okay, sweeping compounds. Okay, another big no-no. These products are uh, petroleum-based. They're wax-based. And I'll be the first one to admit, the only time that I saw a physical stain is where the, uh, the guy using it, you know, left the sweeping compounds in a pile overnight and you remove it and you can see a, a wax stain or a petroleum stain on the surface. But why take the risk? Don't use sweeping compounds, okay? Vacuum dust and debris, you know, get a you know, large vacuum wands uh, with your, your large commercial vacs with HEPA filtration, you know, vacuum down to clean solid concrete. Oil and grease, okay, nothing sticks to it, okay. Mechanically remove all concrete contaminated with oil and grease. You know, asphalt and tar that's a part of a roofing system or maybe, um, you know, other materials, okay. Don't use chemicals, okay. The, the solvents uh, or the chemicals can cause this bonding whatever uh, uh, future product you're using. Mechanically remove concrete contaminated with oil, grease, asphalt, tar. Okay. And when all else fails, bring in the big dogs. And that is one big dog. And when I say the big dog, I'm talking about an industry standard here uh, named ASTM F710. Uh, I mentioned this before. This is the standard practice for, for preparing concrete floors to receive resilient flooring. And in this standard, um, it, it tells you that to, to remove dust and solvent and paint and wax, oil, grease, uh, adhesive, don't, uh, adhesive removers, curing sealing, hardening, uh, parting compounds, salts, carbonation, mold, mildew. You're covered here. Use your manufacturers. Let us be the, the bad guys to write you a letter. Use a standard like ASTF, uh, uh, ASTM F710. Okay, that's your big dog. Uh, to show, you know, the owners and, and, and the architects and the general contractors what needs to be done and, and that you don't have some sort of ulterior motive here. You as contractors are just trying to follow manufacturer's guidelines. Okay. On to joints and cracks in concrete. We're going to look at all of them. Okay, we're going to start with control joints. These are called saw cuts. They're also referred to as contraction joints. And you typically see these with concrete slabs on grade, on ground. And after they uh, screed, float, and finish concrete, spray a cure and seal, they'll come in and saw cut control joints, typically a quarter to a third of the depth of the concrete. So that as this concrete cures and it shrinks, as the water evaporates out of it, the cracking happens at the base of the control joint and, and doesn't do random cracking, okay? Um, control joints are typically filled with a patching or, uh, I'm sorry, a patching compound prior to putting flooring down, uh, done all day long, just like you see in the picture there. However, I mean, there's other joints out there that are actually moving joints. You have construction joints and a construction joint is we pour concrete today we come back tomorrow and the two slabs uh, butt together. That's a joint that goes all the way through the concrete. That's gonna move, one slab will move independently of the other. You have an expansion joint where that's a, a design joint where this slab can move independently of that slab. And then you also have isolation joints and you'll see that um, around maybe around structural columns where a, uh, you have a concrete case on in the floor that looks like a diamond uh, and then you have a slab that butts up to it, maybe it looks like a triangle, and there's a black asphaltic material in there. That's an isolation joint. That joint is isolating the structural column from the, the structural slab. Or maybe you see it where a structural slab meets a structural wall, something like that. But all three of these joints are moving joints, and they should be honored up through the patching and leveling material and the finished flooring. And, and I'll be the first to admit that the owners don't want flooring installed over these joints and 
I'm sure every one of you at some point in your career have installed flooring over this type of joint. And you know what? Uh, if it never moves, then you never see anything. But you know, pretty much it's going to move because they're designed to move. And you're going to see it through the finished flooring um, as soon as the movement occurs. Um, cracks in concrete, okay? You as, as contractors, you know, certainly must, must patch the crack prior to installing flooring because you certainly don't want that crack to show through into your flooring. But the thing that I want you to understand is, you know, whether it's a crack, a random crack or a crack in the control joint, just because you filled it and it's not showing that, you know, the day that, that you installed flooring, um, it doesn't mean that that crack or that control joint is not going to remove at some point in the future. And if it does so, it could show through the finished flooring. Okay. So if there's concern about a specific crack, uh, you know, certainly if the crack is vertically displaced one side higher than the other, then there's, there's movement there. Um, you know, raise the red flag to your manufacturers, raise the red flag to the, to the general contractor, um, get the structural engineer out there to evaluate it. But I don't want you guys to, um, you know, take the liability for, for cracks showing through your flooring, you know, two, three, six months, a year from now, you know, you're just patching that crack. It's just filling that so that it doesn't show through the flooring when you install. If movement happens, it could show through. A couple of pictures here on the left, that's VCT installed over an expansion joint. And you can see that they installed another row because the, the, the die lots are different and they cracked the tile. On the right, you got a crack moving in the concrete that's, uh, you know, it's cracked the, uh, the hard tile as well. If we don't honor them or repair them, they show through. It's possible to do a stitch where you, you saw cut uh, relief cuts across the crack. You drop in um, rebar or masonry nails and fill it with, uh, you know, an epoxy or a urethane uh, crack filling material. Um, but, but realize that it's not a guarantee, okay? Our last topic is adhesive, okay? Under certain conditions, we can install patching and leveling materials over adhesive residues. And in the spirit of the holiday season, you know, are we dealing with adhesive there or is that frozen moisture? That's straight uh, out of the movie, A uh, Christmas Story. I would say that's frozen moisture. All right, so a couple of criteria for installing patching and leveling materials over adhesive on concrete. Um, number one, got to be a concrete substrate. But uh, number two, scrape down to a thin, well-bonded residue. The patch or leveling material will stick to thick adhesive, but that adhesive could fail within itself. So scrape it down thin. Uh, yeah, sure, a four-inch wallpaper scraper for a small area or a, maybe even an eight-inch telescopic handled razor scraper, but um, use your tile stripping machines, use your scrape-away attachments that go on the bottom of your floor sanding machines, uh, ride-behind machines, uh, propane-driven uh, um, terminator-type machines, scrape the glue down thin. Lastly, make sure the adhesive is not water-soluble, okay? Pour the... Um, First, scrape the adhesive uh, to ensure it's not flaking or brittle, okay? Obviously, if the, the adhesive is flaking or brittle, we want to mechanically remove it, okay? Uh, but if it's not, then let's just get some hot tap water and pour it on the adhesive, and we keep that wet for about 20 minutes. We're going to come back, and we're going to rub the adhesive with our fingers, okay? If that adhesive feels squeaky clean, if the water is still clear in color, the water's not dissolving it. But if that adhesive feels slimy, if it feels uh, soapy, if, if the water turns milky or cloudy in color, then the water is dissolving the glue. And in that case, don't use anything with water in it um, over top of that adhesive. Because if you soften the glue with the product that, uh, that has water in it, then the whole system is going to fail. Now, just about all of your glues nowadays are made with water, but that does not mean they're water soluble. Okay, pour clear water on it for 20 minutes. You know, most likely your adhesive is going to do nothing, but th there are still some adhesives that are water soluble. Uh, sometimes your pressure sensitive carpet adhesives are water soluble. 
the old style linoleum paste of, of yesteryear, dark brown adhesive, if you got water onto them, they turn to mush. Uh, do some simple, uh, simple tests here with water. Couple of pictures here, uh, scraping the adhesive with a terminator you know, on the left picture, scraping it down to a thin residue. On the right, we had a water soluble glue and um, using a special blade on an angle grinder to remove that glue down to clean solid concrete. Um, you know, here's an application where they left the glue down in thick residues. They put a patching material over top of it, installed the flooring and the glue's failing. And you can see that I still have, we still have glue left on the floor and there's glue adhered to the back of the patching material, okay? The glue has to have integrity. It's not, it can't be flaking or brittle and it can't be water soluble and it's gotta be scraped down thin, okay? Some materials can stay, uh, contain asbestos like our cutback adhesives, okay? We recommend following the Resilient Floor Institute's uh, guidelines and complying with state and local laws uh, if we're dealing with asbestos, okay? Comply with your state and local laws. Um, you know, if you're able to prepare asbestos adhesive, you know, we recommend wet scraping with warm soapy water like the Resilient Floor Institute recommends. That warm soapy water keeps the asbestos fibers uh, dust from becoming friable and in the air um, and, and not harmful to us. Do not use adhesive removers or solvents, okay? The only people to recommend them are the adhesive removal manufacturers. And the bottom line here, guys, is be disciplined. Do it right every time. I want to thank you for your time here. Um, I want to also mention before we get into Q&A here, to, uh, as, as Chris said, there's a couple of future webinars coming up. We got thick pour gypsum underlayments on January 13, 13th, uh, same time, same bat channel. And on February 10th, we have uh, wooden subfloors and substrates. So I thank you for your time today. It's a lot of information. I'm sorry I sped through it very quickly, but um, I, I uh, can open up the field our allotted time here as long as necessary. Terrific. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Seth. Great information. Um, do you have some questions that have come through? Uh, one from William Thornton. Can you comment please when dealing with silicate treatments in combination with water-based adhesives and potential floor preparation? Absolutely, um, that's an excellent question. Um, as I said earlier with the silicates, um, they react with the free lime and the concrete and they densify it, okay? Um, if a silicate's applied correctly to the concrete, um, and there's no silicate residue on the surface of the concrete. The concrete chemically is, is not changed. It's still calcium silicate hydrate as the material. The, the, the big difference here is the absorbency. So if everything is done perfectly with silicate treated concrete, you know, these, the adhesive still has the ability to stick to concrete, but the, the biggest problem out there in the, in the field is is the concrete is no longer an absorbent concrete material like we're used to. So the thing that I see out there is, you know, a guy, you know, for example, um, thinks it's just regular porous uh, concrete and he uses his standard 16 square notch trowel. He gives it his normal open time that he does on concrete. It might be five or 10 minutes on porous concrete. He installs his flooring. Um, you come back and there's bubbles in the floor. We peel it back. The adhesive is, you know, is, is gummy and gooey and we think it's moisture and a lot of different things. And the reality is, um, you know, in a specific situation here is that with, with densified concrete like that, even if there's no contaminants and no excessive moisture, uh, the absorbency is such that we use the wrong trial. Um, in most cases, uh, some, some manufacturers recommend a smaller notch trial, so we use less adhesive on a non-porous surface, and they often require a longer open time of that adhesive uh, because no moisture is going into the concrete because of the absorbency or the lack of absorbency. So 
um, all things in a perfect situation with silica treated concrete, you know, I tend to see, um, you know, the, the wrong notch trial and, and the open time being the, the cause. But having said that, you know, every manufacturer out there is going to have their own recommendations and their own experiences. And, you know, based on whoever's is being used on a given job, get that manufacturer involved and get their specific recommendations. They may not have a recommendation for using a smaller notch trial and a longer open time with their specific product, or they may have a different recommendation. So that's what I see out there, but, but I, I, I strongly recommend pulling your manufacturers in to get your the specific recommendations for, for uh, that application. Hopefully that helps. That's great. Um, absorbency, <clears throat> it's, I, I see uh, absorbency as being a much bigger problem than people actually realize. They think maybe we've got moisture issues out there, but uh, um, absorbency of over-densified um, concrete compounded by the addition of fly ash, which as you sort of mentioned, is increasing that density and, and the inability of adhesives to sort of you know, um, get into the concrete, into the fissures of the concrete or the um, capillary action. Yep. Big issue. So to help uh, contractors, uh, could you comment on how simple or basic the um, absorbency, the water test is? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And a, a lot of us are on um, uh, that committee. It's ASTM F06. Uh, the, that committee writes all the flooring standards. Um, and, and 3191 is a, is a relatively new standard uh, within the past year or so, but it, it's, it, it's a very simplistic test, but it's a very critical test uh, for patching, leveling materials, materials and adhesive and floor coverings. And it's a, but it's very simple. It's, it's a matter of taking like a, a dime size, you know, drop of water on that concrete, you know, for a 60 second uh, period of time and, and, and doing an evaluation uh, of that water droplet, okay? Is it changing color? Is the water soaking in and, and changing the color of the concrete? Um, is the water totally soaking in to where there's no droplet or bubble of water anymore? Or, you know, is the water just sitting there like you, you drop that water on your, your plastic laminate countertop at home and it just sits there and, and does nothing until it eventually a day later evaporates to, to, to nothing. That water test is, is critical uh, for the installation of patching leveling uh, materials as well as uh, adhesives and, and floor covering, especially in the day and age of silicate use, uh, fly ash uh, and the high amounts of fly ash being used, um, as well as burnished concrete. That's these these they, they're trying to make these floors so flat and so smooth that they burnish them to the point where they're. Even if there's no curing compounds or silicates or, or anything like that, they mechanically seal that concrete with the trial machines to where it's non absorbent. And that, that, uh, that water test uh, used through, um, in multiple areas throughout that slab you know, gives you the, the true understanding of what the surface is. When, so, when you place your uh, dime sized droplet of the water with your eyedropper or whatever, um, the 60 seconds that ASTM spells out, is that, do you want to, is it, is it that you want to see the beginning of absorbency at 60 seconds or, or before, or has, does the whole droplet have to have disappeared or how's that explained? The, the standard basically tells you how to conduct the test so that we're, we're, we're doing the test um, in, in accordance with the standard, uh, you know, for every job. But the, the reality is, is we got to pull our manufacturers in. Uh, and let them be a part of that. You know, even if they can't be on site, I, I have done this on site where I'm watching via FaceTime, you know, them do an absorbency test um, to, so that we can see, or, or maybe they just shoot a video of that absorbency test, you know, real close and, and send it back. But it's critical for the manufacturers to, 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 uh, to make that recommendation based on that test. I can't give you a textbook answer for what, what we're looking for, because what I'm looking for is from, as a manufacturer might be something different than, somebody else and the, you know, so it's kind of like a it's an indicator uh, test to say wave the flag get the manufacturer involved dig yes. a little deeper yeah. yes it's a rough guide yeah no I, very useful test um when you're being pushed to to go over a surface that you think maybe is just too tight and you're there doing a droplet test you you can influence uh, how things sort of proceed and you can buy some time so it's a great test yeah. um 
Seth, we've got another question here. Barry Miniker has asked, let me just scroll up here. I have heard that some batch plants are starting to use slag as an additive instead of fly ash. Do we know how this will affect bonding of flooring? Yeah, that, that's a good question too, uh, Barry. So you, you have fly ash. I'm going to back up a second. I'll go a little bit deep in, deeper into chemistry. So there's, there's a family of products called pozzolins. And, and, a pot, and they, they've been around for, you know, for a lot of years. So fly ash is a pozzolin. Um, ground granulated blast furnace slag um, is a pozzolin. You know, it's obviously remains from a blast furnace. Um, uh, let's see, uh, metacalin is, is a clay-like material that's um, it's also a, a pozzolin. And the, these family of pozzolins um, are supplementary cementing materials. And um, in addition to fly ash, uh, the, the, the ground granulated blast uh, furnace slag, that's used as a supplementary cementing material. And, and the same similar process is happening with these pozzolins as, as I described with the fly ash and, and the silicate. So the chemistry of the concrete happens. Uh, you get calcium silicate hydrate. The byproduct of that chemistry is calcium hydroxide. The, the blast furnace slag, the, the metacalin, the, the fly ash is reacting with that, uh, that free lime, the calcium hydroxide, and, and creating more calcium silicate hydrate and densifying that concrete. So with, with the, the, the blast furnace slag, you're going to have a similar result from a density standpoint as you do with uh, the fly ash, as I described earlier. Uh, so the same things, the same precautions um, can, can apply because they're all pozzolan materials. They're all supplementary cementing materials. And I say supplementary because Portland cement in the water, that's your primary uh, binder. Your, that's your primary cementing material. And, and the fly ash, the, the, the ground granulated blast furnace slag, those are supplementary, secondary, if you will, cementing materials. Hopefully that helps. Terrific. Yes, uh, another question from William Thornton. Uh, on the question of silicate treated concrete, floor preparation, skim coating in brackets, and water-based adhesives, um, self-leveler like K15 and run a blotter layer? Uh, I, know, I know where he's going with it. Um, skim coat compare, I think I do. If, if I don't, William, then, then ask another question. But, but if you have... Uh, silica treated concrete, uh, burnished concrete, or any uh, or fly ash concrete uh, to the point where the, any of these concretes are dense and virtually non-absorbent, and you do a skim coat of a, of a patching material, a pick a patching material, and I mean a true skim coat, trial flush to the surface, and it's paper thin, that will not change the absorbency of that concrete. So, from an adhesive standpoint, there may be adhesives out there that require a certain absorbency. And a skim coat over a non-porous surface is not gonna change that. Whereas if you do an eighth inch of leveling to a quarter inch of self-leveling, now we have a, a blotter layer of, of, of porous material over top of that non-porous uh, concrete so that the waterborne adhesive that requires an absorbent surface uh, is able to have water go down into the pores of that leveling product. So I think that's where William was going with that. Hopefully that addresses it, but if not, ask, ask another question. Okay, we'll assume that, uh, oh, he says, yes, sir. There you go. Okay, good. Uh, Graham Rosen asks, are there any concerns about causing micro fractures in the concrete when uh, concrete that may weaken the surface when shot blasting? Um, shot blasting, uh, no. Um, a shot blasting itself uh, typically does not create cracking. Grinding um, typically would not create cracking. Um, scarifying, uh, and that, that was the machine that had star-like washers that kind of ripped the surface off. That can, that can definitely create uh, micro cracking. And I apologize for not addressing that during that part of the presentation, but um, uh, th there is documentation out there within the industry that that's scarifying can create micro cracking 
the concrete would have to be evaluated after scarification to, to confirm whether that happened or not. I think uh, is scabbling is even a step up from scarifying. Yes, yeah, scabbling is a it's a machine that could be pneumatic or electric, and it has a series that have little nubs on the bottom that beat the concrete, and that definitely contributes to to cracking. And um, you know, I'll go back to grinding. It it depends on you know I don't want to say grinding doesn't ever. It typically doesn't, but. It would depend on the, on the concrete. It depend on the, the diamonds. Um, there, there are PCD blades that are extremely aggressive um, that can rip the concrete. Um, and these machines are, are very heavy, 800 pounds machine. So uh, I don't want to say that it never would cause cracking, but I guess under certain conditions with the, the type of machine and the type of aggressive diming, there is that potential uh, to create micro cracking. Yeah, we've got a comment that uh, Clayton is Clayton Schulz saying he's read some articles that um, sort of attribute micro fractures to grinding in certain circumstances, as you say. Um, it's, it's probably it's, it's probably to, due to the, the the weight of the machine. These eight hundred pound machines, the the aggressive PCD mach, uh, diamonds. They're almost like a little. It's almost like the tip of a spoon that will actually sp spin around on this head and gouge the concrete. And it kind of rips it. So, you know, in certain scenarios, I could certainly see, you know, causing micro, micro crack. Yeah. Uh, another question from William. Uh, how important are primers pre-floor patching? It, it, it's critical when, when recommended. It, it all depends on, on what the product is and what the, what the manufacturer recommends. Very commonly with self-leveling, there's a primer, um, even on absorbent, textured concrete. Um, you know, if we didn't use a primer, the self-leveling, I can tell you, anybody self-leveling is going to mechanically bond, but uh, the concrete's porous. So no, what happens is with no primer, the concrete can suck the water out of the self-leveling, and now it's not self-leveling anymore. And secondly, all the air, is the air that's in the pores of the concrete, that will, uh, as, as the self-leveling liquid goes into the pores, the air has no way to go. Uh, it, it's, it's displaced and it comes out and it leaves air bubbles within the self-leveling. So you have, um, you know, blisters and pockets and voids all in the surface. So from a self-leveling standpoint, um, you know, very critical. Um, patching, um, there, there's some patches that require primer and some patches that don't require a primer. Um, just stick with the manufacturer's recommendations there. Um, you know, in some difficult substrates, you know, patches may require a primer as a bonding agent. Well, here's a good question, um, William Thornton again. Uh, we all get, we all face those sort of charcoal, sort of colored concrete surfaces where old uh, cutback adhesive has been removed and there's yep. still a residue. What do you recommend as the, as the standard legitimate procedure to go over top of, of, uh, of stained concrete that, that, you know, that's basically it's still got a, a cutback residue on it. Yep. So, you know, going back to a couple of bullet points before, we want to make sure that the adhesive is on concrete. Um, we want to scrape it down to a thin residue, like, like William's saying, he's, he's on the site. And um, certainly cutback is not water soluble. So that's a proper uh, method of prep to, for products, uh, self-leveling and patches to receive adhesive. Most self-levelings, but not all, most self-levelings will require a primer over that adhesive surface. Uh, most patching materials, skim coating products will not require a primer. But I will say this, if there's a worry about an adverse reaction between the new adhesive and the existing cutback, do not do a paper thin skim coat of anybody's product and expect that to be a barrier between the cutback and your new adhesive. If you're worried about an adverse uh, reaction between new adhesive and existing cutback, even if that cutback is a is a stain, then you need you need a blotter layer there of, of a leveling uh, material, you know, at least an eighth of an inch, so that um, the two adhesives don't come in contact with each other. Hopefully that helps. All right. Well, I don't see any more questions coming in. Although someone did say that they that uh, you can't see the chat question option anymore. If that's the case, then unmute your mic and ask, you know, verbally ask your question. Um, 
if there are any more questions out there. If not, then uh, good work, Seth. I think you've uh, you've done your your job very well. Thank you. Oh, well, uh, thank thank you, Chris. Thank everybody for joining. Um, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to present uh, to everyone today, and uh, I look forward uh, to presenting again. You guys, everybody, have a great day now, and thanks again for the invite. Terrific. Um, I will just sort of officially.